Welcome to worship at Westminster and to our inclusive family of faith. We especially welcome our visitors and those joining us on YouTube.
Our third reading this morning comes from Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. We'll be reading from the Common English Bible Translation. When Pentecost Day arrived, the disciples were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Uh, There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, even Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness and the moon will be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes. And everyone... Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On my 16th birthday, my thin boyfriend said something a little weird that I needed to go and see the flooding that had happened in their house. I didn't really care all that much. Maybe it's not too surprising that housing issues didn't concern 16-year-old Kate. But I followed along anyway. As he opened the doors to the first floor, I saw not flooding damage, but a flood of my friends and family shouting, surprise! I was in shock at my surprise sweet 16 for a lot of reasons. That no one had managed to spoil the surprise ahead of time. That I hadn't figured it out. And that people would come all the way from Colleyville to celebrate me. (laughs) It was a big deal. If you had asked me ahead of time, I would have told you that everyone who was in that room loved me. But at that surprise party, I felt the love in a new and different way. Have you ever been to a surprise party? Or what was the latest surprise in your life? And was it a good surprise or a bad surprise? It's a valid question. We've ended the season of Easter celebrating God's great surprise in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that's not the last surprise that God has in store for God's people, and nor was it the first. It just takes a brief overview of the Bible to see all the ways that people are constantly being surprised by God. When that giant ark built on dry land actually had water to float in, 
when laughing old Sarah falls pregnant, when the Red Sea is parted for the Hebrew seeking liberation, when walls fall at Jericho at the sound of trumpets, when the runt of the litter becomes King David, when an orphan turned queen saves her people and enacts a massacre of others, when lions don't maul Daniel, when the junior varsity players are picked to be on Jesus' team, when Peter fishes all night and doesn't catch a thing until Jesus shows up, pretty much surprises fill Jesus' ministry, and when a Roman centurion understands Jesus' identity better than anyone else, when God picks a persecuting Pharisee to become one of the leaders of the early church in Paul, when God chooses someone like me and you and you and you to be part of the body of Christ, God constantly seems to be turning things upside down. That sort of seems to be her thing. And yet again and again, we are surprised by God's overwhelming, boundary-breaking, seemingly impossible power. Again and again, we are surprised when God does the impossible, bringing life where there is death, healing where there is brokenness, discomfort where there is apathy, and comfort where there is affliction. Again and again, we forget what the power of God can do, what God's deepest hopes are for God's people, and what Jesus himself has promised. And the ultimate Pentecost surprise party in Acts 2 today the surprise lies outside the closed doors instead of behind them. The disciples were probably a little bit surprised by the Holy Spirit waiting fearfully in their upper room. It had been 10 days since Jesus' ascension and graduation blessings. They were seen in Jerusalem like they were supposed to, devoting themselves to prayer and recruiting a disciple to replace Judas. The city, meanwhile, had filled up with thousands of pilgrims for the harvest festival known as the Feast of Weeks. Maybe the disciples had started to wonder if Jesus was just metaphorically speaking about the Spirit coming upon them, or if they had understood the timeline wrong or misunderstood his scripture references. For many of us, that's not an unusual feeling. That despite our faith in our great God, human limitations take over and we try to put those limitations on God. And although we don't like to admit it, we often act as though sin, death, scarcity, and separation will win. All too often, we, like the disciples, are rendered paralyzed by what's called the tyranny of the possible. That our solutions to problems are limited when we think only within the constraints of what we currently accept as possible. In other words, we get stuck thinking that challenges are too big or we don't have enough money, people, time, or we have never done it that way before. We get stuck thinking that we can't have a choir without our irreplaceable minister of music. We get stuck by coming up with solutions based on what we know, the limited possible solutions that are right in front of us. But Scripture sings a different song, rejecting the tyranny of the possible. Our key verse for Vacation Bible School this week comes from Ephesians 3.20, which tells us that God, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. God is bigger than what we can ask. God is bigger than what we can even imagine. The Reverend Dr. Jill Duffield, editor of the Presbyterian Outlook, puts it this way. Pentecost obliterates the tyranny of the possible, or at least it should for Christians. Jesus' resurrection, coupled with the coming of the Holy Spirit, ought to convince us that through Christ all things truly are possible, not the least of which is reconciliation with God and neighbor that is made manifest in boundary-breaking, genuine community made up of people from every tribe and nation. God surprises God's people with who he chooses, with where she goes, with what new and unexpected thing appears. God offers us the ultimate surprise party, making way for love, grace, redemption, inclusion, and resurrection. 
And the Pentecost surprises are not in a vacuum, but are connected with God's actions in the past. We read of the struggles of the relationship between God and humanity in Genesis 11 as the people were figuring out what it means to belong to each other. It's a good example, what it means to belong to each other. Out of fear and anxiety, people come together to try to build a tower to the heavens. And for some reason, we don't know, this displeases God. Maybe it was a focus on pride and making a name for themselves. And so God creates different languages to scatter the people and provide the foundation for Babel, later known as Babylon. And here, though, we are at Pentecost, thousands of years later, speaking different languages scattered to the ends of the earth, and yet the Holy Spirit refuses to keep us apart. Instead, the Holy Spirit uses our differences to bring us together as one body. Surprise! The arrival of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit mean that we don't have to remain scattered from each other and from God. It means that we don't have to give up our own identity either. Pentecost turns the story of Babel upside down as God's people are brought together, not out of fear or anxiety or pride, but instead by the good news of Jesus Christ and the mighty works of God. Pentecost brings believers together who trust in the power of God instead of their own might, who trust that God will save them. God brings together at Pentecost what was scattered at Babel, transforming God's words in Genesis 11:9 from a threat to a promise. Look, they are one people and they all have one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. God builds a unity based not on a racing identity, but instead bringing together diverse people to accomplish God's mission. God is not limited by the tyranny of the possible, instead choosing to create something new and redeem what had been broken. When we start to look for it, we find the tyranny of the possible all around us and also the ways that we overcome it. In Massachusetts, there's a two-year-old little girl named Samantha. She's incredibly friendly, always wanting to connect with her neighbors. And when someone engages with her, she lights up. And when they don't, she gets a little sad. You see, there's a barrier. Samantha is deaf, and her neighbors don't know sign language. The tyranny of the possible would tell us, oh, that's a shame. Eventually, Samantha would learn to read lips or to write or find community with other deaf people. But surprise, her neighbors were committed to letting Samantha know that she belonged. So they got together and hired an American Sign Language instructor. They take classes together, all of them learning another language, simply so Samantha, and by extension her family, know that they belong. Her neighborhood rejected the tyranny of the possible in favor of creating the sacrament of belonging. And now when Samantha walks in at the end of their neighbor's class, the first thing she signs is friend. I love the Pentecost connection with Samantha's story and her neighbors, breaking down barriers that all might know and understand they belong. And I couldn't help but hear that story and think of us at Westminster, the work we put into hearing each other's stories and creating a space for all our neighbors to belong and know that they belong to God. I'm proud that at Westminster we often reject the tyranny of the possible instead of in favor of the Holy Spirit breaking us open. We rejected the tyranny of scarce resources when we said yes to New Day three years ago, packing a hundred bags a week of food for hungry students. Did you know that we're up to almost 500 a week during the school year now? We rejected that same tyranny of scarcity when we needed to come up with a sports gift for every Swift Elementary student on a very, very short timeline last year. We rejected the tyranny of division when we came together with Baptists and Catholics and everyone in between to give away tens of thousands of backpacks and school supplies through Operation Excel. 
And we rejected that same tyranny when we said yes to finding a new partner for vacation Bible school outside our denomination and primary racial ethnic category. We reject the tyranny of the unknown when we found our partners with living waters for the world, helping install water filtration systems in Nicaragua and Belize so that all may have clean water and know of the living water. We reject that tyranny that would keep us in boxes and closets when we said yes to the Inclusive Faith Coalition, reflecting our full welcome of LGBTQ people, proclaiming to the world that God is bigger than our human boundaries and divisions, tearing down those barriers for the reconciliation of the world. We reject that tyranny of isolation by embracing Bridge of Hope, a brand new pilot program where we intentionally neighbor and support a single parent family, providing a solid foundation so they can stabilize, grow, and flourish in the name of Jesus Christ. We even often reject the tyranny of the possible on a smaller level. When healing seems to defy what we thought we knew, when each little stitch on a quilt or prayer shawl adds up, when we cover strangers with faithful prayer, when we cross all sorts of identity boundaries to claim belonging as a family of God, as a place where people care, we reject that tyranny every time we let a program lie fallow, believing it is not failure, but creating space for God to do something new. We reject that tyranny every morning when we receive new mercies from God in spite of the pain or grief or struggle in our lives. Where do you need to reject the tyranny of the possible in the name of faith? Where in your life do you need to remember God's promises again and again? Maybe you need to hear one more time that God is with you, that we are with you, that God is faithful still. Maybe you need to hear one more time that God calls you, yes, even you, and equips you and pushes you out these doors and into the world to declare the good news of Jesus Christ, the salvation that is for all nations to the ends of the earth. There are a lot of surprises in the Pentecost story, a violent wind, tongues of fire, country folks speaking the language of cosmopolitan visitors. But the Reverend Jessica Legroin, Dean at Asbury Theological Seminary, points out the biggest surprise of all, the change in the followers of Jesus. She writes, once they received the Holy Spirit, they were different, bolder, more able to minister with power from above, less afraid of human retribution, more unified and certain of their purpose to spread the gospel. Surprise! God has sent the Spirit as promised, and their lives can never be the same. Surprise, the transformation into leaders of God's people and the early church, it sticks. They go on to baptize 3,000 people. Surprise, their story is our story, a story that rejects the tyranny of the possible in favor of faith in our God who is bigger and greater and our God who will stop at nothing for the sake of reconciliation. So brace yourselves. Surprise. God is on the move, not confined to a tomb or a church or one people. Surprise. God is on the move in you and through you and with you. Surprise. God can do more than we can imagine beyond our wildest dreams, rejecting the tyranny of the possible. Surprise. The Spirit is still moving today, calling all of God's beloved to share the message of salvation. Surprise. God chooses diversity to define a community of believers, creating a sacrament of belonging. Surprise. This party is for you and you and you and you and you. Surprise. Thanks be to God for the ultimate surprise party. Amen. On behalf of the session, I present Ida Joyner, who has been received into this congregation by transfer of letter. And as Ida comes forward, now's a great time to plug again that if you'd like to officially join our family like Ida has, 
We have new members class next Sunday and June 23rd, and our next session meeting is June 30th if you've already been to class. Ida, we rejoice that you now desire to declare your faith and share with us in our common ministry. In baptism, you were joined to Christ and made member of his church. In the community of the people of God, you have learned of God's purpose for you and for all creation. You have been nurtured at the table of our Lord and called to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hear these words from Holy Scripture. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket but on the lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. As you publicly declare your faith, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which you are baptized. So Ida, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Do you? Yes, I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? Yes, I will. You now publicly profess your faith. Will you be a faithful member of Westminster? Share in our worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, through your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Will you? Yes, I will. Let us pray. Faithful God, you work in us and for us even when we do not know it. When our path has led us away from you, you guide us back to yourself. We thank you for calling your servant Ida to the fellowship of your people. Renew in her the covenant you made in her baptism. By the power of your spirit, strengthen her in faith and love that she may serve you with joy to the glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us welcome our new member as she joins us in the worship and service of Westminster.